Well, I'm actually sorry to say that this is the last week of the Nameless series because I, I love this series and <laughs> be quite frank, it's probably the perfect series for me to teach uh, because I'm so bad with names and I'm so bad with introductions. Um, some of you know that. Many of you know that because I've met you. Um, some of you two or three times. I'm always like, hey, I'm Don. Nice to meet you. And you're like, we did that last week and you don't remember. Awesome. Uh, but I'm terrible, terrible at that. I'm terrible with names. Um, and uh, even in our leadership team that we've worked together and known each other for some time now, like I still get everyone's names wrong. I sent out an email um, this week, thankfully, I stopped it because I, <laughs> I said uh, that Rich and Denise were camping this week and would be gone. Um, unfortunately, they're not married to each other, so that would have been awkward, and we don't allow that. Um, so I'm <laughs> I like this nameless thing, though. This nameless thing works perfect for me. Uh, because I can kind of say, like I would normally say, like, you know those four knuckleheads who cut a hole in the roof and let their friends down to see Jesus? That's awesome. And so that's what we've been talking about all month, just just nameless people in Scripture. We talked about the, the four knuckleheads one week, and we learned from them that, like, anything short of sin that gets your friends to Jesus, that's what we do. And I shared with you that this church has always been sort of founded on that story. We love that story because Jesus didn't say, hey, why'd you do that? Or do you have a permit? He just took care of business and healed their friend. And I love that story. We talked the next week, we talked this a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the immoral woman who came to Jesus and we don't know her name, but it's an awkward, awkward story. But we learned from that, like how to worship and how to not forget that we're forgiven because we learned like that the, the religious guy in the story, he just thought Jesus should just be happy to be in his presence. And this, this woman with such a bad reputation, she understood that all of us, um, all of us in the end, um, Wow, we owe everything to Christ. And then on Father's Day, I got to tell you a story of a guy who we just go that centurion. We don't know his name. Um, but the kind of the leadership lessons we learned from him um, still are sticking with me today. I don't know about you, but this idea that he leveraged every bit of power that he had for those he loved. I uh, love, love, love that story, and it's helped me be a better father, I believe. And then last week, we talked about a man born blind, and, and um, he, here's the thing. If you've sort of noticed a pattern, it's not very hard to figure out if you've been to Action Church more than one week, and if it's your first week, yes, it's as weird as it looks, and yes, you'll catch on that every week sort of the hero is Jesus. It's always Jesus. If we go, hey, who's the guy? Jesus. That's always the answer, like Sunday school. Uh, but every one of them met Jesus, and every one of the stories we've talked about so far, they were completely changed, um, forever changed, because of that experience. And that's the truth about Jesus. Um, you can't just meet him and not be changed if you really get to know um, Jesus. Now, here's the thing. We don't know their names, and so what we've learned this month, and I've seen so many of you sort of grasp it, and I've seen some of you live it out for years, but this idea that you can bring change, even if no one knows your name. In this celebrity-driven culture we have where we feel like you have to be an expert or you have to have a million Twitter followers or you need to have you know, a million Facebook friends, you need to be in government or you need to be in, in the entertainment industry to do anything important, we find again and again in Scripture and we find in life no one even needs to know your name to do amazing, meaningful um, things that still affect us today. That's what the people in Scripture did. Now, here, here's the thing I want to talk about today, though. Um, and it has to do with what happened last week. Well, last week, we celebrated. And if you're here the first week, it's awesome. You, you can catch up really easily. You can go watch a video on our, on our website or on our app. But last week, we served at this thing called Relay for Life. And it was fun because, like, there's like just an obnoxious amount of, of Action Church folks running around in their shirts that say, love God, love people, take action. I think we had over 120 volunteers out of there, out of a little church like ours. It was amazing. And we served our faces off and everybody was kind and friendly. And, and here's the thing though, I don't know about you, but it's weird like after that sort of tiredness wore off and you go back to work on Monday or you went back to work on Tuesday, it was sort of weird to go, we're not at Relay anymore. Like, not everyone here is wearing an Action Church shirt. Not everyone is that interested in service. Trust me, I went to a couple places this week. They didn't seem even interested in customer service. You know, and it's just weird because, like, you get in that mindset and we all gathered together and we all celebrated that last Sunday and then you sort of go out into real life, if you will, um, 
And you go, I don't know exactly how that translates every day. And that's what I want to talk about. Because there's always been this thing in church world uh, where we have events or we have sort of moments or special services or our friends that are at creation this week or have come back, they're going to experience that next week. Like you're with all these Christians, with these brothers and sisters, and you go to church every day and you, you sing worship songs and then you kind of go back to work and you go back to life and you're like, my friends don't do that. What do I do um, what do I do next? And that's, that's what we're going to talk about. And, and that's seriously, that's a, that's a situation that's not new. That's not something that's for Action Church. It's been around forever. This idea of what do I do when I go back to, quote, real life. And, and it's been around. I know it's been around forever because I'm like 100 years old. I grew up in church. My dad was a pastor. And I used to get sent to this thing called church camp. Did anyone here go to church camp? When there were, I bet I'm the only one. There's, there's like three people have been to church camp. Now, here's the thing about church camp that you know, or at least you knew when, when I was was um, not 100 years old. You would go to church camp, and you'd probably hook up with a girlfriend. That would be awesome, but hooking up didn't mean then at all what it means now. I'll just say it was like, if she held your hand, that was awesome. But like, you would get a church camp girlfriend. You were pretty sure, certain of that. The odds were good. The odds were always in your favor. But you would also, at some point in church camp, you would find yourself like promising God that you would not do anything sinful ever again. Like you were going to be crying at the front of the tent at some point at church camp. And then at some other embarrassing point, you were going to be holding hands, swaying, singing friends are friends forever and promising everyone around you that you would keep in touch. You know, we're never going to forget this. And then you'd forget it like two weeks later and you'd go home and long before you forgot to write your church camp girlfriend, like, that wasn't going to happen. Or you realize, like, she's long distance. <laughs> you know, you don't even know what long distance is, but that costs money. So you weren't going to phone her. And you weren't, but all of a sudden you realize, like, my friends don't sing Friends or Friends forever. They don't even like Michael W. Smith, you know, like, and I'm not going to admit to them, I sang to Michael W. Smith. And, like, they don't go to church every morning in chapel, and they don't all of a sudden, they're not all followers of Jesus, so what do I do like the rest of the time when I get back to real life? And I think it's just a, it's a good question to deal with. And what do you do next? Um, and so let's talk about that this morning. Now, to do that, I'm going to introduce you to one more person. Um, and this is the most awkward introduction ever. Jesus meets a naked, homeless, demon-possessed dude. That's the best way I can describe it. That's the way scripture describes it. I don't know what that meeting was like. I'm betting there was like lots of eye contact, you know, like side hugs only. Like it had to be weird, but that's just cool because Jesus pulled it off perfectly. And so let's just read this. This is found in Matthew and the book of Luke, and we're going to read it uh, from Mark 5 this morning. It's up on your screen. And it says this. It says, so they arrived at the other side of the lake. It's Jesus and his disciples in the region of the Gerasenes. And Jesus climbed from the boat. A man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. And this man lived among the burial caves, and he could no longer be restrained even with a chain. Uh, other, other passages that talk about this guy said that they would shackle him with like handcuffs and, and chains, and he would just break them. And it says, whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and he smashed the shackles and no one, no one was strong enough to subdue him. And day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. Now, let's just deal with like the most awkward part of this first, other than the naked thing. Like we get that part, right? But let's talk about this whole idea that he was possessed by an evil spirit. Um, now, now here's the thing that's awkward about this and sort of weird to talk about, and we can just like be honest here at Action Church. Like if you open the New Testament, if you read in the Bible, like it seems like Jesus and his disciples are doing nothing but like just casting out demons all the time, right? And that wasn't true, but it seems like every other story is a story of Jesus casting out demons, right? And here's why that's kind of awkward and why it's kind of like old-fashioned sounding because we live in a world 
where it's sort of gone the other way. Like, we don't talk ever about demons, except, like, if we're joking, you know, like, that toaster is possessed, you know. But, like, generally speaking, that's just, like, stuff we see in horror films, and we can't imagine, like, actually someone being possessed by a demon. And it's funny because, like, a lot of people won't even deal with this t topic in churches. Like, I've heard this story, this very story we're going to talk about, like, basically the way they turned the story into this preacher that I heard basically was, like, and Jesus gave a homeless guy some clothes. And I'm like, well, there was a whole other part in there that you're sort of skipping, but it's hard to talk about. And I also realize that why this is really touchy to talk about is because we don't talk about, what if we imagine a guy, like a homeless guy, running around with his clothes off, what would we say? We probably wouldn't go straight to he's possessed. We would say he has a mental illness, right? And that gets really touchy because there's probably not a person in here that doesn't either deal with mental illness or have someone in their family that has mental illness, so nobody wants to talk about it because it's just awkward, and we're afraid like that if we do that, people will think like we're saying mental illness is demon possession, which is not, and it's just very awkward and like smart churches and smart preachers like never talk about this but we are not a smart church and I am not a smart preacher so I made a chart okay like that that always works out good right when I make a chart so let's let's talk about this um and I'm also going to use my little telestrator thing um which I think is demon possessed because it never works correctly we're going to try this like there was a time let's just is this true like let's agree on this maybe there was a time where people thought the demons were in everyone, right? <laughs> like, there was a time in our history, maybe you've read about it, like, if you had asthma, <laughs> we didn't give you an inhaler, we gave you an exorcism, right? Like, there was a time, right, when everything was demons. Like, no matter what, like, you couldn't learn long division, demon possessed. You know, like, you had the sniffles, demon possessed. You know, like, no matter what, no matter what illness, no matter what, like, you did, like, you were too good, you were too bad, whatever. Like, we, we suspected that there were demons in everyone, right? So that happened, right? You've seen that. And, and actually, in primitive cultures, there's still cultures in, in uh, Africa and different places where, like, demons demons are a big part. I had to say that like a preacher, like demons are all like part of culture. Like, you know, we cast demons out. We, we pay the witch doctor to get the demons out. We pay the witch doctor to put the demon back in. You know, like there was a time, even in America, when we suspected like demons were everywhere and that was a common part of culture. Now, we live in a time over here, wouldn't you agree, that we don't see demons in anyone, right? Like, we just don't, we, we, we value the physical world so much, and we're so skeptical of the um, sort of spiritual world that we don't think of anything as being demonic. You know, like, everything is either, we go, well, that's mental illness, or that's drug addiction, or we, we sort of have just very, like, very physical explanations um, for behavior we can't explain, right? Like, is that true? Would you agree with that? Like, when, and, and this is straight out of the news, like when a homeless man jumps on a tourist and holds him down and eats his face off, we go, we don't say the demon. You don't want to say that's demon possessed, and I'm not saying it is, but we say that's mental illness, right? Or that's got to be drug abuse. That's bath salts. That's something. So we always have an explanation um, that is not demons, right? So used to be demons in everyone. Now we believe demons in no one. I believe in demons because I had a Volkswagen Vanagon from the 80s. That thing was possessed. I just know there are evil spirits in this world because it would overheat no matter what I did whenever my wife drove it and not for me. So I believe in demons. I'll just tell you up front, that's me. But I'm just, let me just posit this. Maybe think about this. Like, wouldn't you agree that possibly, and here's where I am on demons, like somewhere just like they used to over prescribe demons like I don't think asthma is demon possession and like now nothing is demon possession like even if you hear voices and go shoot up everyone at your job we don't go we go oh it's probably a medicine that would fix that like I'm saying somewhere in the middle my guess is at least um, that there is still demonic activity in our world that all the demons aren't on break. You know, <laughs> like they took the month off. Like we're totally tired of all that demony stuff we used to do. So here's what I want you to do. Like whatever you think about that. And you can be skeptical about that. Like you don't have to believe me. It's not like I'm an expert. Not like I'm just a nameless guy who paints rental houses for a living. I mean, that's me. But let's just think about this story without that. Like even if you don't really believe in demons or you're skeptical of demons, what would you say about a guy, and we can imagine a guy like described in this, 
the story, right? Like a guy who's totally out of control. Um, in fact, I want you to notice this. It's pretty important. Notice that it says that no one was strong enough to subdue him. Like they had tried. <laughs> I know it seems kind of barbaric like to put shackles on him. Like we wouldn't do that. But come on, come on. You know people. Like you know people. Maybe they're in your family. Like I've experienced this. We've experienced people that are like impossible to stop them from harming themselves and others. They're out of control. Like, you know people like that. I know people like that. And like, no matter what we do, no matter what therapy, no matter what medicine, no matter what, like, maybe even rehab we send it to, it seems like they're just out of control and impossible to stop from harming themselves and others. Um, and here's the thing to remember even today. So, so you can be totally skeptical about demons, but think about this. Don't we know people like that? In fact, if you've ever been like in the city or, or somewhere and seen a... a I think I've seen, in fact, I know, in Baltimore, I actually saw a naked homeless guy one time, but you've seen the guy that's out of control. He's a homeless guy, he's saying strange things, he's kind of threatening, possibly not clothed, but like, you know what his family says? And here's the thing to remember, that guy, that guy you're sort of scared of, that you kind of walk on the other side of the street of, that's somebody's family. Like, they've tried, like, they've probably tried to get him to take care of himself or keep him from harming himself or others. Like, they've dealt with that and they failed, and you and I, here's what we say even today, um, right? Like we would say they're fighting their demons or they're dealing with their demons. So even if you're skeptical about this whole demon thing, say, hey, that's cool, you're welcome, you don't have to believe like I do, but, but think about this story. This guy is totally out of control. He's harming others, he's harming himself. Nothing they can do will stop him, and I love, love, love that Jesus walks right toward him. Um, it says this in verse 6. He doesn't run away. He doesn't look the other way like you or I might. He says, when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him. And he ran out to meet him, and he bowed low before him. And with a shriek, he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. And Jesus demanded, what is your name? Now, I know you're going to catch me on a technicality here. Like, I thought this was the nameless series. And this is totally, this is not the man's name. Notice, this is the name of the demons. Because it's, <laughs> I don't want you to, no technicality. It says, Jesus demanded, what's your name? And the man replied, my name is Legion. Because there are many of us inside this man. And the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. And there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs. The spirits begged, let us enter him. Now, I know this is like loaded with all sorts of stuff. And so let's sort of break it down and like deal with the weird stuff, like one thing at a time. Now notice this, like, and you'll find this in scripture, there are no atheist demons. Like these demons believe in Jesus. And you know, he's like, and in fact, in the book of Luke, in Luke 8, 31, what the demons were yelling, we find was don't send us to the bottomless pit. It's not time yet. You can't send us yet. Our time's not up. So, so we find this, this weird happening of these demons actually, and it happens again and again in scripture, are actually going, Jesus, you are the most high God. Don't torture us. Don't send us to hell. Um, and maybe that's why it's just such a, such a weird thing for us to imagine, but like these demons would, would cry out to Jesus. And in fact, it kind of cracks me up because Jesus' brother James said something based on this that is still true today. You know, people would say to him, well, I believe in Jesus. And maybe because he'd seen this happen so many times traveling around with Jesus, he's like, the demons believe in Jesus. Get over yourself. That's no big deal. But the demons were crying out to Jesus going, please, please, please. Don't, don't send us to the bottomless pit. And then let's notice this, that it says, um, this is another weird thing in this story. Um, he said, we're legion. There's many of us. Many of us. Now, now here's something to know about demons from Scripture. Um, there are many, uh, because legion could have at that time met hundreds or even thousands, you know, in their, their sort of their Roman culture. We're not sure don't have an actual demon count, uh, but, but, but there were many, but there are a finite number. Like demons can't be everywhere. Like they're not like God that sees everything. They're finite number of demons. Um, probably plenty to go around from this, we would think, but there's not an infinite number. And also I want you to notice, and this is sort of the pig or the elephant in the room, 
send us into the pigs. I don't know why. I've been thinking about this all week. I have no explanation. Maybe they realize that pigs are made of delicious pork. I don't know. Like, I mean, maybe they, and, and it's weird, you know, I know that they weren't supposed to eat pork as nice Jewish boys, but, but like, delicious stuff inside of a pig you know I, the rear end of it actually even tastes good that's amazing like but I, I don't know why they wanted to go into the pig but you'll find that pigs don't fly very well at all I think that's where that came from because it says so Jesus gave them permission and the evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the hillside and the lake and drowned in the water and pork prices skyrocketed in the whole region and it was sad and the herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside spreading the news as they ran um and people rushed out to see what had happened and a crowd soon gathered around jesus i'll bet <laughs> and they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons and he was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane and they were all afraid isn't that amazing like this guy who was so out of control that no one could stop from harming himself and others. This guy who was a danger, who was a menace to their society. Like he's naked and he's loud and he's hurting himself and no one can stop him. They find him with Jesus. And whatever you want to believe about demons, whatever your theory is, somehow Jesus, by sending these evil spirits out, this naked, homeless, dangerous guy, becomes fully clothed and perfectly sane. And I call that a good day. I mean, that's a good day for me. I mean, that's powerful. Um, and notice it says that people were afraid. Isn't it interesting? Like people were less afraid of having this out of control guy in their neighborhood than they were of the flying pigs. I don't understand this, but like we're like that. We like we're like we can deal with the 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 poor naked homeless guy who's harming himself. We understand that. We don't understand. They were actually more afraid that all of a sudden his life had completely changed. It's just amazing what we can get used to as people. Just evil, dark, horrible situation. We go well. At least I understand that. But this is weird. And the scripture goes on. It says this. It says, then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. Going to be a bacon shortage. And the crowd began, now, now notice this. This is weird, but it's, it, it's I, I can believe this. It says, the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. And as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Now, imagine that story. Like, Here's the guy who's been like wreaking havoc on this whole community. Here's the guy who's out of control. Here's the guy without clothes. Here's the guy just completely like harming himself out of control. And now they find him thanks to Jesus. Like he's fully clothed. He's fully sane. Um, and he's like, take me with you, Jesus. Right? Like you can imagine that. Like I'm going with you. I'm going with you, Jesus. Let's get out of here. I'm joining your crew. And that's sort of the question, and I don't know, like, what your background is. Um, maybe you were naked and out of control at some point. I know I was. But, like, I don't know what your background is. No pictures. Thank God that was before Twitter. But, like, I don't know what your background is, but I know that we've all sort of, or all will, if we meet Jesus, we sort of deal with this question. Like, what do you do when you realize that you can never go back to the person you were before, and the truth is you don't want to, like you're a different person now. What do you do when your friends, and just like this guy, isn't it amazing? Like the people around him were more comfortable with him being like naked and demon possessed than they were sitting there like talking to them because that was weird. Like, and, and you know that and I know that. Like we've experienced like been around people we've been around all your life and like one of the weirdest situations I ever have is when I go back to my hometown sometime and they're like, you're a preacher? I mean, it's, and I'm like, I can't believe it either. You know, special situation. It's not a real church, just barely, you know? Like, I don't know, like it's just so weird and that's what he was dealing with. He's like, what do you do when your life's completely changed? What do you do when your friends like can't even imagine you as this new person? And what do you do, which this guy had to deal with, what do you do when the crowd rejects Jesus? Notice, like, they're like, hey, Jesus, get out of here. Like, you are freaking us out. Like, you are bad for the local economy. Like, the Chamber of Commerce is not giving you the key to the city. Get out of here. 
And, and, and this poor guy is like, man, take me with you. Now, now here's what I think is stunning about this story. Because what happens next is not what you would expect, right? Because Jesus is pretty known for going what? Follow me. Come with me. Like he went up to fishermen and said, come along with me. I'll make you fishers of men. And they didn't even know what that meant, but they wanted to come along because it was awesome. Um, and as church people, if you're a church people like I am, like I've got a thousand suggestions, right? <laughs> like Because I'm like, Mr. Formerly Demon-Possessed Naked Guy, I got a class for you, like, right? Like, I want to give him a class. I want to, like, give him a reading list. I want to go, and you'll start attending services, you know? Like, we've got, we totally put this dude on the setup crew, like, immediately, because it fit right in. But, like, I mean, I don't know, like, but you've got a thousand things that you would do or you would suggest, or if you've been in church at all, you're like, there's got to be a group for that. There's got to be a support group. There's got to be, like, a small group. There's got to be a reading list. We've got to start teaching him the Bible. We've got to start getting him to church. We've got all these things, and what Jesus says to him is so opposite of that. And Jesus said, no, you're not coming with me. Go home to your family. Tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. <laughs> this guy couldn't listen very well, obviously, because he did something different also. He said, so the man started off, I'm sure he went to his family first, to visit the 10 towns of that region. And he began to proclaim the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. See, isn't this an amazing story that Jesus didn't take him along? He said, no, just, just, just go home. And he said, tell your story. Tell how merciful, like, I, <laughs> I can't imagine, like, how that conversation went. But, like, hi, you probably don't recognize me with my clothes on. Like, I was the guy formerly of the cemetery. You know, like, I'm not bleeding. Very, you know, it's like, I, I don't know how this is. But he's like, I used to be that guy, and I'm not that guy because of Jesus. I have completely changed my life. And, and we know from the book of Matthew, there's, there's in Matthew 4, it talks about how Jesus had these huge amount of followers, and they actually mention these ten towns. Like this guy completely changed his whole region with his story. And I want you to notice something like the people rejected Jesus, but they listened to this guy. See, what Jesus told him is basically this. He said, go home, tell your story, give God the credit. And see, I think that still works today. In fact, I know it does. In fact, like, we're in the church business here. Like, we didn't do this, you know, we started Action Church about six years ago because of this. Like, I get up and talk to you every week because I'm not the same person I used to be, and I want to make sure that I give Jesus the credit for that. And we do all of these things, and we have groups, and we, we have teaching, and we have apps, and we have podcasts, and all of those things. But all of those things are not instead of this. They're so you can do this better, like the whole point of what we do. And if you've ever wondered, well, what comes next? If I met Jesus, what comes next? I think it's still this. You don't have to be a professional. You don't have to go away to Bible college. You don't have to, like... Any of those things could help you, but I'm telling you, go home and tell your story and, and give Jesus the credit if he's made a difference in your life. And I, I want the band to come back up here, and I want to pray with you one more time. Um, but you can, you can bring change. You can bring change even if nobody knows your name. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have a microphone. You don't have to have a platform. Like, in fact, the most powerful thing that you have um, and that I have is, is our story um, and the changes that Jesus makes in our life. And I, I don't know where that hits you. Um, maybe you were thinking, like, oh, I just feel like I need to become an expert or I don't know enough or I don't have enough information now. If you've been changed by Jesus, you have exactly enough information. Um, or maybe you need to take the next step. Next month, we're going to offer baptism. We're going to dunk people in water. And Scripture says that's a way of proclaiming, like, I have been changed forever by Jesus. 
maybe it's time to do that. Maybe it's time to just invite your friends to our baptism and barbecue and go, I got to tell you something. Something has changed in me and I, I'm just going public with this and, and come eat some barbecue and they're going to dunk me in a horse tank. I don't even understand it. You know, like, I don't know what that next step is and we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, but I know this. I know this one thing. Like, it's not as complicated as you think. It could be as simple as just go home. Tell your freaking story and give Jesus um, the credit. Let me pray with you, dear Jesus. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for the way you deal with us. Thanks for loving us, God. Thank you um, that because of you, we are forever changed. And God, most of all, thank you that you use absolutely just average, nameless people to do amazing things when we give you the credit. And God, we want to be a church full of people like that. God, help us to be a church full of people like that who tell our story, give you the credit. And God, I just pray it just spreads over this whole region just like this guy did. Um, thank you for loving us, forgiving us, and changing our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Yeah, this is awesome. Okay. Thank you so much to Raph for turning my mic up. There we go. Uh, All right, here we go. Thank you so much to Brian. Give Brian Cameron another hand. That was yeah, awesome. That was Thank you so much to them for playing this morning. They have uh, their merch out front, so definitely hit them up if you're interested. Hey, I don't even have to ask you, but um, you got World, Fe World Cup fever, right? World Cup fever. Uh, I, got a, I got a rash <laughs> I want you to look at, but other than that, I don't think I got any fever. <laughs> that comes later? Yeah, um, no, I, kind not, of. A little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I can tell you a lot of stuff about World Cup. But that's well, funny. I would be really interested yeah. in the games if Dale Jr. would drive his car through the yeah. field. But I, other than that, here, here's what I'm thinking. I'm pretty sure it's about biting now. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm pro-biting. Yeah, yeah. pro-biting, definitely. Here's, here's what I realized, and our conversation points out. There's a real lack of of good sports analogies at Action Church because yeah. we don't have it. And so we brought in some experts for you next month. Um, we're going to do our first, and this is all because we planned this for four years, yeah. waiting for this Definitely. moment when the World Cup would be happening and um, we're going to have our sports camp series next month. And I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna that take one, you, person, uh, one person is really... Yeah. <laughs> so I'm along... See, I, I have a buddy who uh, lives in a different state, and he like was telling me, my pastor was like a football coach, and like <laughs> he's like talking about how much all these football metaphors, and I'm like, that sounds awful. I don't know why you keep going there. But uh, Well, we're going to awesome get here. real men who have sports <laughs> analogies. Our leadership team is going to share all sports-related sermons, and all of us ladies, including me and Josiah, will also enjoy it. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but anyway, that's... That's next month, also at the end of the month, and you can keep up with us on the app. Hey, I'm yeah. segueing nicely. Uh, we have a picnic baptism barbecue thingy coming up in a few weeks, so take it away. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you can uh, on the app, if this is your first time or if you missed some of the weeks that we've had, you can actually catch up on the app and see some of the old sermons that we've preached this, just this series, and yes. we keep posting on And we also keep you, instead of a bulletin, if you get the app, we will keep you up on every detail you don't even want to know about Action Church. So it's, wow, it's, that's a, that's that's a sales, sales pitch. pitch. <laughs> if you have any questions or comments, you can. Uh, we have cards out there at, with Marion this week with, instead of Denise, and Marion right. would love to address your questions, or if you I'm don't feel... I'm glad you told me that would have yeah. been awkward, because I would have called her Denise. Thank yeah. you. Uh, you can fill out a card and, and write it down in there, and we'll get back to you. Um, we also have action groups that meet, so if you're interested in more information on them, you can fill out a card about that, too. Uh, so we have something. Tell them what they've won. Oh, <laughs> yes. We have we have, and, 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 um, we have have and a gift for you. And if it's your first time at Action Church, we just want you to know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, what a weird church we are, because we're not going to try to get your information or your address or your social security number. We just want to give you a gift. So please see Marion at the table, and she has one for you. Are there churches that want your social security number? Oh, yeah. And okay. We'll totally get it later, but right, I'm just yeah. saying, All like, right. your first time, you're not going <laughs> to get it. So thank you for inviting your friends, investing your money, and getting involved. You guys make this happen every week. We we all do this together. It's awesome. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything to pray say about for that. us. I'll pray. I know you're just all caught up in World Cup fever, so just pray. It's actually, this at, this rash is really itching. But <laughs> Go ahead. A rash is really itching. It, it, anyways, all right, I'm gonna pray after that. It's lovely. Anyways, uh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, just thank you for this this beautiful morning, and, and I thank you for these these people in these Bibles, these real lives that we don't know their names, but we know their stories. And I thank you for each one of us that maybe uh, we have our own story that we can tell. And I, I pray that we go out and, and we love you and tell us about it and, and do something about it. In your name, amen. amen. See you guys next week.